Hebrews chapter 2, 17, and hopefully get through the end of 3, maybe. We'll see. So already the writer has told us why Jesus is better than the prophets. And then he told us why Jesus was better than the angels. And last week we talked a little bit about why it might be better to be a human than to be an angel since Jesus took on human flesh and lived and died and was raised up on our behalf. Uh, In this section, the writer gets really personal. He's going to talk about Moses and Aaron. And to various degrees, the Israelites would have been very connected to the prophets and the angels, but let's say you were a Sadducee. You don't believe in angels, right? So how, how does that work when you're talking about passages of Scripture that were reportedly given by angels if you don't believe there are any? So that would have been a little less terrifying for them. But every Jew period uh, had a great deal of respect, awe, admiration for Moses because Moses was the great lawgiver. And next to him, you've got Aaron, who was the first high priest. So the law which establishes the priesthood is connected to those two brothers, Moses and Aaron. So now Jesus, or the writer, is going to start to compare Jesus to Moses and Aaron. So if you're going to decide whether you're going to be wholeheartedly a Christian or whether you're going to backslide to just being Jewish, this is kind of the heart of the matter. And so beginning at the the start of chapter 3 and going on for several chapters he's going to build his case about why Jesus is better than the law, the priesthood uh, the old covenant all of those things uh, kind of rolled into uh, Moses and Aaron here at the beginning so Hebrews 2 starting in 17 for this reason he had to become like them fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And then the big word, therefore, because those things are true, holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all of God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So he mixes up his metaphors real well. There's three or four different things that uh, he does here in the first part of chapter 3. First of all, Moses is seen as the house. Right? Moses was faithful in the house. Uh, but Jesus is seen as the builder of the house. Uh, a house is a beautiful thing, but how did it get there? How was it built? I thought of a couple of uh, kind of marvels of the world. One, the Taj Mahal. Uh, I've seen lots and lots of pictures of it, and I've heard stories about the love affair and how the thing came to be. I've never heard anyone really talk about who designed it or who built it. We look at the building and we go, wow, what a magnificent building. The same thing's true about like the Washington Monument, the White House, the Lincoln Memorial. We look at the edifice and we go, isn't that a magnificent building? But very few people would know who the architect was that put together the designs or who the builders were who put that thing together. So uh, the argument the Hebrew writer is making 
is that you can see Moses, and Moses was a good man, and but he was put there for a purpose. He was built by somebody besides himself. He wasn't just a self-made man. He was a God-appointed someone, and he would make the same argument about Aaron a little bit later on. But uh, we love the statistics. We love the beauty of these buildings, but the bottom line is buildings don't build themselves. So God is the architect. God is the building by connection Jesus is the builder and Moses is the house okay then he changes the picture just slightly and Moses becomes a servant who is working inside the house now Moses was a tremendous servant he did some things that uh, most people would have turned down in their job description uh, oh, you want me to, to go up on the mountain where all that lightning and thunder and fire is and be in the presence of God for a period of time and then try to lead this unruly group of people from Egypt all the way to Canaan? Uh, he was a very faithful servant. But then the writer says, it's good to have a faithful servant, but he doesn't own the house. Jesus owns the house. He's the son. So when it's time, the father gives everything to the son, and he owns the house. Then he kind of brings finally the, the most important thing. We are the house. God has built us into a spiritual dwelling place for God. And, uh, in uh, 1 Peter, Peter describes us as a place that has been built up as a suitable dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. So... God built us. We didn't just happen. We didn't make ourselves. But God has called us and built us to be a dwelling place for his spirit. Look over at Luke 17. We'll get one more voice in here. Luke 17 and verse 7. A little quick parable that Jesus tells. He says, suppose one of you has a servant who is plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Or won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also... When you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. So Moses was a tremendous servant, but he didn't own the house. He was just a servant. So by the end of his life, uh, the people of Israel would come to almost revere him, almost as a godlike figure, and look to him as an authority because he brought the law to the people from God. But he's not the house. He's not the builder of the house. I'm sorry, he is the house, but not the builder of the house. He's the servant. He's not the son. So the writer is trying to remind them that they've come into contact with someone more important than Moses. Moses was good, but Jesus is better. Uh, Now the we that he points to, he says that we are built up into uh, God's spiritual house. He then says, if we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. One of the problems that these folks were having was that they had given up on their confidence. They no longer felt secure in their relationship with God because of the persecution that was going on around them. And they figure if we can slide back to just being Jews then we can kind of mix in with the rest of the Jewish population and we won't have the kind of persecution that we're getting being Christians. Because they were Christians, they were getting persecuted both by Gentiles, outsiders, Romans, and by Jews. So they can cut their problems in half if they just kind of side with the Jews and fall back into line with them. And then there's this other phrase, the hope in which we glory. A word that means to celebrate, to be uh, involved in bragging about something. Well, when they were first 
converted, these folks were excited about it. They were bragging about their relationship with Jesus. But now the pressure's on, and they don't want everybody in the world to know they're Christians because if they start bragging about their relationship with Jesus, it might cause them problems. Uh, Roll forward to our generation. We are the house of God. We are created to be the house of the Son who has been to whom we've been given. How often do we feel comfortable bragging about that relationship? Or do we sometimes worry about what are they going to think if I get too excited about my Christianity? If I say something about why I'm so involved in the church or why I'm so involved with Jesus, are these folks going to look at me cross-eyed and think I'm a little weird? Um, So we kind of know who we can talk to, we know what we can say to whom, and we measure our words. Paul says when we started out, we held firmly to our confidence and we had hope uh, that made us excited, that made us glory, that made us brag about our relationship with Jesus. So when we get down to uh, verse 7, the tone switches just a little bit and it's going to stay there all the way into chapter 4, which... We won't get there tonight. But the question is, did Moses finish his job? His job description was, lead the people of Israel up out of Egypt to the land of Canaan. Did Moses get them into the land of Canaan? No. Got them to the front door. But he didn't kick it in, right? He left that to Joshua. So he did a tremendous job, but the people that he was leading out of, I don't know, 600,000 men on foot, plus women and children and their livestock, two men got to go into Canaan. So that whole generation perishes in the wilderness. And the writer is going to discuss that lack, that problem, uh, for the next chapter and a half to talk about the fact that as Christians in their generation and Christians in ours, that we've been offered the same deal. In Jesus, we've been offered the opportunity to come out of slavery, to come out of sin, to come into his blessings, and to eventually enter into the heavenlies. So uh, there's going to be a comparison between Moses and how good a job he did with his generation, and Jesus and how good a job he is doing and by comparison, how good a job are we doing in uh, fulfilling that uh, opportunity? So, verse 7, chapter 3, verse 7. So, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation And I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Now, hang on to that word, rest, because, again, the Hebrew writer isn't just going to have one meaning. He's going to have more applications than one when we get to it. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As it has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. And who were they that heard and rebelled? Were they not all those that Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Now, was it Moses' unbelief? No. It was the unbelief of the people But the unbelief of the people affected Moses' ability to finish the task at hand. So Jesus now has a task at hand. 
And we are, we have the opportunity to either fulfill what Jesus has done for us by being obedient and hanging in there, or we can undo what Jesus has done for us by giving up and, and turning away. Uh, notice a kind of similar phrases here. Uh, verse 14, we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end compared to the verse up here in uh, 6, Christ is faithful as the son over God's house and we are his house if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and to the hope in which we glory. So the Hebrew writer has a lot of ifs. Right? Here's the opportunity and you're in the right place. You're, you're the household of God if you hang on to it. Uh, the people in the wilderness were given freedom from Egypt. They go out into the wilderness. They don't hold on to their hope. They become disobedient. Their faith goes away. When their faith goes away, they can't follow God's design, and God lets them die out in the wilderness. So Moses is not able to finish his job because the people won't let him finish his job. So now the possibility of rest falls to those who are following Jesus. He's done a perfect work. Nobody can blame Jesus if they're lost. The opportunity is there. But as we go into chapter 4, and we'll do this next week, he'll start talking about the problem of unfaithfulness, the problem of you know, falling back, giving up, not following through, not uh, uh, hardening our hearts as those people did. And again, it, this is all about a group of people in the first century who are afraid to let their Christianity be seen because they're afraid it will come back to haunt them. So they are beginning to you know, shade away from their Christianity so that people will leave them alone. The people out in the desert, God had a plan for them. He had a leader for them. Everything was there for them. But they didn't get to enter into the rest. And by rest in that context we mean the land of Canaan. That was the ultimate goal. That was the ultimate finale that they would all get to go in and enjoy God's gift in the land of plenty. But that shifts as we get into chapter 4. And again, there'll be more than one interpretation. Um, notice verse uh, 16, though. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those that Moses led out of Egypt? So the question is, who's the better leader? Which one is going to be able to fulfill his mission? Did Moses fulfill his mission? No, not really. He didn't get him into the land. Okay, he, he got full of himself and died in the wilderness, was buried uh, on the mountain. And, you know, Jesus was faithful, even to the point of dying on the cross. He's now raised from the dead. So he's entered into the rest already. He's already over there bringing us in. So there's no fault for Jesus, but there may be a problem with those who are following Jesus. If they begin to worry and lose their faith, like those folks who uh, did not get to enter into the land of Canaan. Now a couple of interesting things toward the end of chapter 3, the way that uh, it's worded. Verse 18, To whom did God swear? that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed. So we've got God swearing, right? making an oath, which is kind of a, not kind of, it's really an interesting thought that, uh, that God would be making an oath. Uh, later on we'll see the, the statement that since God could find no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself. So God swore to God on some of these matters. So things that you and I wouldn't normally think the Hebrew writer kind of brings up in conversation. Uh, one other thing I forgot way back at the beginning. Did you notice in uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 1, that Jesus is called an apostle? Did that pop out at you? Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. So 
when you think about Jesus in his earthly minister, ministry, uh, Jesus was Jesus, and then he had 12 apostles. The word apostle means to be sent out. So Jesus was sent by God, and he tells his apostles, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So as the Father apostled me, so I am apostling you. So the, the writer here uses that word to describe him. But this is the only place in the New Testament where that word is used directly to describe Jesus. Jesus is our apostle. And then Jesus is also our high priest. So the later on we'll have a lot more discussion about Jesus as a high priest. But the apostle and high priest, when they came out of Egypt, who were the apostle and the high priest? Moses and Aaron, right? So uh, Moses and Aaron were fabulous. They did a great job, sometimes better job than other times, but they did a great job doing what God had called them to do. Jesus is better. And so he's going to continue with that line of thought, uh, on in, especially as it pertains to uh, Aaron, for several chapters to talk about why we needed a new high priest, why we needed a new covenant, why we needed a new sacrifice. All those things are, are coming up in the next few chapters. So any questions or thoughts about chapter 3?